Hello, I uh, hope you guys are having a great time here at uh, Rock Sharp. I am, for sure. Um, am I on screen? Yes, okay. So for the next hour, we're gonna be talking about .NET debugging. So we're gonna be talking about how to troubleshoot things like crashes, performance issues, memory leaks, anything that you can't step-by-step -step debug, essentially. And if you can't step-by-step -step debug, then you have to resort to some other things, like you have to resort to things like profiling. We'll have a look at that later. But you can also resort to things like memory dumps. So how many people here have actually de debugged a memory dump before? Okay, awesome crowd, yes. So memory dump, for those of you who haven't, um, can either be a user mode dump or a kernel mode dump. And a user mode dump, which is what we're gonna be using, is essentially a snapshot of the process. So you're stopped at a breakpoint, and you take like a picture. You can't move forward, you can't move backward, but you can kind of investigate the state as it is right now. And investigating the state, you can find a lot of clues about what's what's been going on. So we're gonna be using that. Um, and in fact, we'll have a look at what such a memory dump looks like. So for that, I'm gonna use this tool called WinDBG. Uh, WinDBG comes with the development, like the development SDKs like um, debugging tools for Windows or Windows drivers kit. Actually, it's a good chance that you already have WinDBG on your machine, even if you don't know it. So I'm gonna open up a crash dump in this case, is a crash dump of something that's actually crashing. It's, it's called a crash dump, even though it doesn't crash, so you can take a crash dump of a hanging process or something, it will still be called a crash dump. Is this a good size? Can you guys see it in, no? Like that? Yeah, okay. So, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go ahead and, <coughs> add a magnifier, so whenever I'm typing something down here, you can also see it at the top of the screen if you want. And I'm gonna go ahead and, and open up a scratch pad. So a scratch pad is basically a, is kind of like a notepad that you can use in WinWG to um, uh, keep track of what you're doing, so to speak. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy in a few commands so that you can follow along. So the first thing, when you open up Crash Dump, what you'll see is, how, what happened when the crash, when the dump was taken. So in this case, what happened was we gathered the dump with proc dump, which is a tool that we'll look at in a bit. Um, and we gathered it because we're, we're getting an exception, a CLR exception, so a .NET exception. And then going down here, we can see that the thread that we're actually on is doing a race exception. So this is pretty good evidence that we're actually throwing an exception and not handling it. Uh, now we can run the first command on the left, which is til, tilde star kb. So tilde means thread, star means uh, all, and k or kb means show the stack. So tilde star k will list all the stacks for all the threads. Um, this should be fairly similar to what you're seeing if you're stopped at something in Visual Studio, for example, and you just look at the call stack. You might not recognize what all of these are, but um, I'll go through just a few of them. Um, I'm gonna scroll up and hopefully you won't get nauseous from the, um, uh, the zooming at the top, but here we have something called a finalizer thread. So in each .NET process there is a finalizer thread, and this is the one single thread that will, um, uh, where all your destructors will run. So if you have a destructor on any of your objects, whenever it's garbage collected, it will run on this thread. The reason I'm pointing this out is because if the destructor hangs or blocks or waits for anything, or if it throws an exception, you're screwed. You will not be able to release anything, in, like any more .NET objects in that case. So. Um, be mindful of what you do in destructors. But then we scroll up to the first thread, and in a case where you're taking a crash dump on an actual crash, the first thread is the active thread. So that's the thread that actually caused the problem, so to speak. And you will notice here that um, 
there is a lot of like mumbo jumbo about MS Core Lib underscore something something. Super hard to understand because this is .NET code, and WinDBG by default does not understand .NET code. So we need to do something about that to get like the real function names. And what we do is we call this load by SOS CLR. So what that means is <laughs> try to make my mouse stay on this podium. Okay, that's not working too well. Here. So what that means is we're going to load up a tool or an extension called SOS from wherever it finds the uh, CLR.dll. So this is um, this is a DLL that comes with the .NET framework. So that means that SOS will actually be on your machine just because you have the .NET framework. And once we've done this, um, we can then run other commands like CLR stack, um, which is show the managed stack or the .NET stack. And what this will do then is just print it out just like we're used to in uh, Visual Studio, and we can see things like what happened here was we called next button click. That in turn called this other function, like go to another from some view model, and that threw an argument out of range exception. And we didn't handle it, so we crashed. So those are a few things that you can do in, in memory dumps. Like a few other things that you can do. This is really annoying because it's falling down. Let me see if I can fix that problem. So uh, other things that you can do is look at what's on the stack. So we can do that with DSO, dump stack objects. And what that will do is it will um, go through and list all the objects on the stack. So this will be what's in your watch window or in your autos window. And up here we can find things like the argument out of range exception um, that we're throwing. In fact, we'll see a couple of them because um, as opposed to Visual Studio that actually lists just what's on your active frame, this will list everything on the stack. Um, but it's actually one and the same exception is listed multiple times. And then we can dump that out um, and get all the details, like all the member variables and things like that. So like the message, which was index was out of range, or the parameter that we used. And we can dig in and get more information from that. Um, we can also, like, so that's what you can do kind of on the, on the stack. So we can also go in and run a command called lm, which is load modules. Um, so load modules, what, what it will do, or list modules, is it will list every DLL and every exe that's in the process. So you can find out things like, um, here, um, these are the DLLs that are in my process, but what's the version number? So if you have a crash and you want to kind of figure out, did they actually install the latest uh, fixes or whatever, you can find out that from LM. And then finally, you can get uh, something that you're probably not too used to from uh, Visual Studio, and that's memory information. So we can find out, for example, with dump heap stat, we can find out all the objects that are on the heap. So all the objects that are currently in the, in the process and that haven't been garbage collected. This is really nice because .NET, the way it allocates objects is it allocates them basically one after another. And every object has information about how big the object is. So it knows how to list them. So that's not possible, for example, in the C++ process, but it's possible in, in .NET. So we can list out every object that's on, that's on the heap, which means that we can list out, for example, every single uh, string that we have. Um, I'm going to run a command here to remove like the uh, underlying blue things, because they're a bit bad for performance. But um, we could do things like dump out all the strings. So dump heap and well, we'll t do type system dot string, and we'll do only the ones that are over 500 um, bytes. And then we can go in and dump these out. OK, 
case, so that was a bad example of a string because it wasn't a string, it just happened to have the name string in it. Let's see, dumpy panty, like that. Should never ad lib things on stage. Okay, so let's um, take this string. We dump that out and we'll find, like, this was the string main. Um, so what does that mean? That means that anyone can go and create a dump of any process that you make. So that means that they can all find out everything that's in your process. So if you store your API keys or whatever in plain text, then someone can go in and actually figure them out if they have enough time to go through all these strings. But it also means that you can, also, you can get to any single object that's in the process and find out information about it. So something that you might want to go through is like, figuring out why a certain object is still around. So we'll take a look at that in the memory section. So we went through threads. We can see call stacks and stack objects. We can see modules like DLLs and EXEs. And we can also see anything that's under .NET heap, like .NET objects. We can find out sizes of the objects or other information about them. Now, that's something we can do once we have the memory dumps. So how do you gather the memory dumps? Well, you have a plethora of tools that you can use, but some that I like are Task Manager, because it's super easy. You can use to right click on any process in the Task Manager and select Create Dump. So that is really good. The only problem with that is, or and there are two issues with that. The first issue is that if you're on a 64-bit system, which we're most often, and it is a 32-bit process, you will get a 64-bit dump, which makes it super hard to troubleshoot. Uh, the other thing is that you might sometimes want to grab a dump when something happens, like when, when the process crashes or um, anything like that. And in that case, it wouldn't work with the task manager because you can't just be there exactly when things happen. So then you can use something called ProcDump, which is a tool that comes with sysinternals, or you can download from sysinternals. This is a really, really good tool um, for a couple of reasons. First, um, it has really great parameters that you can use to, um, to gather dumps, for example, on a crash, or the dash C is for when the CPU raises over a certain threshold, or dash H if a window is hung in your process for more than five seconds and things like that. And it's super lightweight, so you can actually just take the procdump.exe and put it on another machine. So if you have a server that you want to grab a memory dump from, but you don't want to install something, you can just grab procdump from your own machine and put it on the server. And then there is a tool called debugdiag. So debugdiag is also a free tool. Um, you download it from debugdiag.com. Um, and it's a tool that both gathers memory dumps, but also analyzes them. So we'll look at uh, the analysis part later. But this is a tool that makes it really, really easy to create rules for when you want to gather memory dumps. So it can be when a performance uh, counter reaches a certain threshold, or it can be when you throw this kind of exception, even if it's handled and whatnot. And then for analyzing them, we've already seen WinWG. Um, but you can also analyze them in debug diag, or you could analyze them. So when you analyze them in debug diag, you'll actually get a report like this, um, and we'll have a look at a lot of those. Uh, but you can also analyze them in Visual Studio. So Visual Studio has gotten insanely great at um, debugging memory dumps. So you can use the same kind of skills that you use normally when you troubleshoot and use them on memory dumps as well. So we'll start off with crashes. Now. Uh, if you're lucky and you have a crash, then you'll get some kind of description like this, something that you can reproduce and um, you can already gather from the information that is given kind of where the problem lies, that the problem is somewhere where um, they have large files and maybe it's a uh, memory issue or whatnot. More often than not, you'll end up with something like this, like my mom, she says, yeah, test. The internet thing is not working anymore. And then I ask, okay, so what did you do? 
and she goes, oh, I didn't do anything. <laughs> yeah, not her response. But if she didn't do it, then who did it? Like, who caused the process to crash? Um, and again, there are a couple of things that can do this. Um, one is, and this is the most common one, is an unhandled exception. You throw an exception, you don't catch it, the process will crash unless it's an ASP.NET process. In, case, in that case, there is like a global exception handler. But in a VPF process or in a, um, any client process, essentially, you'll crash if you have an unhandled exception. Or it can be any of these three. Um, stack Overflow exception, obviously, when you um, overload the stack, so if you have like an infinite recursion of something. Um, or an out-of-memory exception, if you can't allocate any more memory because there is just not enough space to do that. Or an execution engine exception, which is when the framework for some reason crashes, so in the .NET framework, which means that the garbage collector is crashing or something, that means that you can't allocate anything. In all of these three cases, you don't actually throw an unhandled exception, you kill the process on the first chance because once you reach one of these scenarios, you can't actually allocate any more memory to do any exception handling. So that's why I put these separate. And then finally, probably the most common one when it comes to ASP.NET is that someone else is actually killing or recycling the process, whether it be like IAS or um, what have you for whatever reason. So might seem silly, but it's, it's pretty common. So when you have one of these issues, then uh, you can just go through three pretty simple steps, like check the event viewer. It has lots and lots of information. And then capture a dump on the crash. So set up, for example, proc dump to capture a dump when it crashes. And then look at the thread that was causing the, like that was active at the time. So, We'll go ahead and open up a process here. So this is just an application that shows um, the US president. And it happens to have an issue, at, like if you go here and click next, it will crash. We all know how that went. So um, we want to figure out what went on there. So we can open up proc dump. Um, and say proc dump dash MA. MA means grab a mini dump with all options. So that's like the biggest uh, memory dump we can get uh, of the process called the precedence.exe. And we want to do that on dash E, which means we want to do that when it crashes. So dash E means it has to crash for together a dump. And I'm going to repro, and I'm going to start this up, and then run this, so now it's just going to sit there and monitor and wait for the process to crash. And it doesn't matter if it's like a client process or if it's a server process. The only thing that matters in that case is that you start proc dump using a user that actually has, it's bigger than like an admin or someone who owns the process. And I'll go like this. And it gathers memory dump. And this is actually the one that we already saw in WinWG, so I'm not going to redo that. But you know, remember, we did CLR stack. We saw the call stack, like where it was throwing the exception. We could go in with uh, dump stack objects to see the exception and dump it out a little bit further. Um, sorry. Uh, but we can open it up in debug diag instead. So debug diag, I guess I mentioned, is Apart from just gathering memory dumps, it's also an analysis tool. So what this will do is it will perform, it will run some scripts on common things that we think cause crashes and figure out or try to figure out what's going on. So I'm going to start the analysis. And so now it's going to go through and do like, um, show, and like show all the stacks, blah, 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 and look for run uh, dump exceptions and whatnot. And we'll get a log that looks like this. So immediately, by just running this, it will tell us that 
It was, in fact, um, an argument out of range exception with this comment, and it happened on thread zero, and then it will give us the stack. So this is pretty neat, because without, having, without knowing how to use WinWG or anything, you can immediately fight, figure out what's going on just by running your memory dumps through this. And this is just one of the scripts that it's running. So it's running, it can also run uh, scripts for memory issues and performance issues, as we'll see later. It will also show us a couple of things like what other exceptions are on the heap. So this is the argument out of range exception and its stack, but it also shows, for example, these. Um, execution engine exception, stack overflow, and out of memory. Now, remember how I said that once these happen, you can't allocate anything anymore? So these will always be present in the dump because we create them at the startup of every .NET dump or every .NET process because we know that once we run out of um, stack space, we can't create them. So don't be alarmed if you see these. Um, we haven't had a stack overflow. We haven't had an auto memory. We haven't had a for an execution and an exception. They're just going to be present in all .NET processes. We could also open the same memory dump up in Visual Studio. So in that case, we'll use the file, open, and grab the memory dump. And we'll get into this um, view where we have to choose like, how we want to debug it. So debug with managed means only .NET memory, or mixed means .NET and native if we don't exactly know what's going on, or native only. And um, in this case, we know that it's a .NET exception. It says so here. And if we open it up, it actually is going to point us to exactly the line of code that had the issue. And in here, we can also th see things like if we hover over a variable, we'll see the um, information about it. And we can look at things like the call stack, for example, and anything that we're used to if we're stopped on a breakpoint. Essentially, these are all the same things that we saw in WinWG, but in a more kind of digestible format, if you will. So that is how you debug a crash. So check the event view. Oh, I didn't check the event view, actually. So let me go ahead and do that. And if I would have checked the event view, I would actually have gotten the answer already here. But then we wouldn't have to get to debug, and that's no fun. So. Um, but check the event viewer, capture a dump on the crash, and look at the faulting stack. OK, so that was uh, crashes. Let's go ahead and look at performance issues. So performance issues, and basically the app is not responding, requests take too long. By the way, when requests take too long, make sure you determine what is an OK response time? Because you have to know kind of when to stop looking or when to stop optimizing your code, or else you'll, you'll end up optimizing it forever. Or um, that the CPU is going really, really bananas. So what causes these problems? Well, you can divide them up into either a low CPU or a high CPU issue, because they are caused by a few by different things. So a low CPU issue. Obviously, we're not doing anything, so if we're not doing anything, we're waiting. So we're waiting either for an external resource, like a web service or a database or something. In that case, we'll grab a memory dump of that process and figure out what's going on there. Or we're in a deadlock, like just have two threads that are waiting for each other. And if it's a high CPU issue, it's going to be like a tight loop or something like that, or maybe a high CPU and garbage collector. High CPU and garbage collector happens when, whenever you allocate, um, for example, if you allocate a lot of large objects, that will cause the garbage collector to constantly do full garbage collections. And that will happen, for example, if you concatenate large strings. Because any time you add a string to another, you have to create a new string. It doesn't just like expand the string. Because remember how I said like every object is tightly uh, allocated one after another, and we don't really have we don't really have a way to to do that warp and expand the memory. 
So if you have a performance issue, what you do is, again, three steps. Determine if it's a high and or low CPU, kind of to know what to look for. Capture one or more memory dumps, and this time, the more is so that you can determine if, um, if you've actually made any progression between dump one and two. And then look at all the stacks. So figuring out, because you don't have one culprit, you have a bunch of stacks that could be hanging. So we'll take a look at how that looks. Um, for that, I have this site. So if I am go into the product section, it's going to just be blocked for a while, and I want to figure out what's going on. So I'm going to go ahead and not open that. Let's see. Um, I'm going to open up like a poor man's um, load test. And what this will do is essentially just run um, a request for the product site and the product page um, on eight threads for 10 seconds, like throw, it, throw at it as many requests as you can. And while we're doing that, we're going to be looking at Task Manager to figure out if it's a high or low CPU issue. Let's see, so details. And the process we're going to be looking at is W3WP. So we're looking at this particular value over here. And for those of you can, who can't see it in the back, it's going to be a super low CPU. Like it's varying between 0 and 2%. So it's definitely that we're waiting for something. So we're going to run that one more time, but this time we're going to grab a memory dump while we're doing it. So I'm just going to prepare proc dump slash ma w3wp.exe and run. Okay, it's not working too well with this. So let me go ahead and do this instead. I'll run it one more time and I'll grab the memory dump from here. Okay. So now we have a memory dump and we can open it up in WinDBG. I have two different WinDBG versions here and one is 64 bit and one is 32 bit. So W3WP will be 64 bit, which is why I'm using that one. So I'm just going to grab that, and I'm going to prepare with loading a few things. So let's see here. So I'm going to load up SOS. And I'm going to run tilde star e bang CLR stack, which is going to basically go through all the threads and run CLR stack to show all the .NET stacks. And if we look through all these, I'm going to zoom in a little bit on them, we'll actually find, for example, in this case, we have, it's calling into some data, data service, get all products, and then it's sitting to wait. And we can go through, and all of them actually happen to sit in this exact same thing. So with this, we can kind of figure out that we have an issue in this data service, get all products. If we open the same thing up in debug diag, let me go ahead and add that file like that, and do a crash hang analysis. It will now do it slightly different thing when it comes to the script, because it will do like a hang analysis script, and it will tell us that all of these threads are sitting in a monitor wait, so a lot of threads are sitting in a wait. Um, if we go to one of them, it will then tell us that all of these have the exact same stack, so it's definitely an issue. Like, do we, if we solve it on one of them, we'll solve it on all. And again, we get the same stack as we did before. So right here, we're pretty much already home. And if we want to just do this in, um, in Visual Studio, let me see. 
Let me just close this and open up that same file in Visual Studio um, and do debug what managed. Okay, that was not good. Close. I opened up the wrong file. Here, so debug would manage only. Um, this time, um, we don't get an actual code place that we're looking at because we don't have an active thread that's causing the problem. So what we'll have to do in, in this case, and this is something that you can actually do when you're step-by-step -step debugging as well, is we'll go into debug windows and look at parallel stacks. So parallel stacks, what this will do is it will go in and look at all the threads that are running in the process, and it will kind of give you the stacks of all the threads at the same time. And in this case, it actually coalesces the threads, so it says, Eight threads have the same stack, so I'm not going to display this one by one. So I'm just going to display them all together and say, you're in this issue in the get all products. It's doing a wait, so we can go ahead and, and actually click on that and get straight to the place where we're doing the block or where we're waiting. Isn't this pretty neat? Yeah? Okay. Um, so that was debugging a hang that happens on a server and something that's fairly long. But sometimes you have performance issues that you can't actually grab a memory dump off because they're so tiny. Um, like one that we have here in the, in the precedent app is if I click next all the time, you'll see that in some cases it will kind of stutter and spend a little extra time before it goes to the next guy. And in that case, we can use profiling instead. So I have the project open, and the way we do this is we're going to analyze performance profiler in Visual Studio um, and use the performance wizard. So um, once you open the performance wizard, you have a number of options on what you want to profile. So the two most common ones for performance issues are CPU profiling or instrumentation profiling. CPU profiling is obviously if you have a high CPU issue, and what it will do is it will go in at set times, like every so often, and it will slice the stack and say, who's on top, who's on top, who's on top, and that's going to be the one that's uh, recording as having the highest CPU usage. And then instrumentation is another version where you actually put a marker on the entry and exit of all calls, and it will then record actual time taken, so clock time from beginning to end of that method. And since we have a low CPU issue in this case, we're going to go with the instrumentation part. And attach to the president staff, and start it off. Okay. It didn't work because I have a memory dump open with the same symbols. So let's do this one more time. Analyze, performance profiler, start, instrumentation. Okay, and we reproduce the issue. Like that, and we can stop profiling. So now it will record all that data and kind of tell us what it thinks the problem is. So in this case, um, it says that run, application run, has been running for 99% of the time. Well, that's pretty obvious, but we want to figure out what inside it is it that's taken like most of the actual lapse time. And out of the total amount of time in the process, we've been spending 37% in next click which is also pretty natural because I managed to click like basically a third of the time. In inside next button click, most of that time is spent in this function go to another, which these progresses. And then in the precedence to display uh, set property, in race property changed, invoke, and then it went into something called convert. And for all of you who, who are working with XML-based or XAML-based uh, applications, this is obviously when you have a value converter, so something that 
uh, convert like something from the data model to something on screen. So in this case, um, the converter here is the party, like the, the party that the president was belonged to, to a color. Um, and once we get into the get color function, it tells us that we're spending most of our time in a wait. So we're spending most of the time here. So profiling can get us extremely close to figuring out, like, so it can tell us how much of the time you're spending, you're actually spending in, in what function, and figure out hot paths that you want to optimize. Um, so, determine if it's a high or low CPU, capture one or more dumps, and look at all the stacks this time, uh, either in WinWG or through parallel stacks. And if you uh, can repro and test, or if it's a sm something super small, then you use a profiler instead. Now, the final thing that we're going to look at is um, memory leaks. Um, and for memory leaks, we have symptoms like out of memory exceptions or slow response times because the CPU is just working too much. Or maybe you see a memory increase in, in performance monitor or in task manager. So a common question is like if we have a garbage collector, then how can I be leaking memory at all? Garbage collector should take care of, of our memory, right? But it will only take care of the memory that you, you're actually telling it that is supposed to be freeing. So if you have something in a cache or in session, then, or in session state, then obviously it can't um, collect that. If something is in a static or held on to in a chain by a static, it can't pick that up. Um, or if you block the finalizer, remember there was only one, so if we block that, we can't delete anything else. That could also cause a memory leak. And then we have some more obscure cases like assembly leaks that can be caused by using um, regular expressions wrong, for example, because every time you use a regular expression, it will create like a small dynamic assembly that represents that regular expression and things like that. Uh, and in most cases, it's not an issue, but if you use them wrong, it, it could be. Or it could also be a native leak, so you might be calling into some C++ code or something like that that can actually leak because you can allocate and not deallocate. So in this case, what you do is um, you capture multiple dumps and you could just capture one, and that's okay when the memory is super high, but normally you want to capture like a couple of dumps along the way to see and compare what you're leaking. So to see also the progression of that. Um, and then once you figure it out what types of objects you're leaking, you'll figure out why they are still sticking around. So we'll have a look at how that looks. And in this case, um, I'm just going to go ahead and open up a memory dump that I've taken earlier of a process that was leaking. So take this one. And let's see here. Give it approximately the right height. No, okay. Damn it. <laughs> I'm sorry about this. This is like normally <laughs> like I don't have the challenge of a podium that's moving so much. What we'll do is like this. So I'm going to call out the, in the commands I'm running instead. I'm going to do dump heap dash stat. Um, which will dump out like all the objects that we saw earlier. And, and then we can go in and see uh, what type of objects we have in the stack. So in this case, we have, for example, 31,000 HTTP response objects. That's kind of unusual because normally like an HTTP response object or an HTTP request object will only be one per request that you're making. And once the request is gone, 
the HTTP request or response object should also be gone. So unless we're doing 31,000 simultaneous requests, we shouldn't be seeing this. And if we scroll up, we'll see something else like myshop.controllers, news controllers. So this is a controller for the slash news um, API or, well, for slash the slash news URI. And we also have 31,000 of those. So normally when you look at things that could be weird, you look at things that either is something that you, like classes that you created, or like in this case, like the HTTP context, you seem out of whack. And then what you do is you dump them out and figure out why they are still around. So I'm gonna run the command prefer underscore DML zero, and this means that we won't show the blue lines anymore. And then I'm gonna dump out the, um, the news controller objects. So I'm gonna grab, okay. Like that, and run dump heap dash mt. Sorry, dump heap dash mt, and then a method table. And it's going to be a while because they we have thirty one thousand of them. think we can start. Meanwhile, I'm gonna also go ahead and, and open this up in debug diag actually. And let debug diag go through a .NET memory script. So now we have, these are the controller objects. So we can grab one of them and maybe do dump Bobby on it, like if we want to know some more information about it, like, I don't know what the um, request was or something. But what we're more interested in is why it's still sticking around. So in this case, we're going to do GC root. Uh, and what this will do is it will say, look at this object and say, who is holding onto this and who is holding onto that and who is holding onto that all the way till we get to something like a pinned object or um, cache or something like that. So now we see our news controller and that's held onto by something called a cache item removed callback. At that point, if you don't know what a cache item removed callback is, you can, uh, I don't know, Google it or something. But what it is, is an event handler that happens when, an, um, when a cache entry is expired. So if we go in and look at the code for this, actually we'll see that when we went in and add something to cache, we said once that cache item is expired, go ahead and call this um, cache item removed callback, and I can call this particular function. The problem with this is that to call this function, this object has to be around, like this news controller has to be around, because otherwise we couldn't call the function since we're using the disk pointer and we're calling it like that. Uh, and that is actually why this uh, news controller is being kept on the, ha on the uh, heap and leaking. Um, if we would instead have used a static function, we would have gotten rid of this. But that particular piece is not as interesting as just like how you figure it out. So dump out the objects, do GC root to figure out like who's holding on to it and, and then troubleshoot further from there. When we ran this in, in debug diag instead, um, we got a bit more information because it ran a few more commands. Like it told us, for example, it was three, 603 megabytes of .NET memory, which is useful to figure out if it's a .NET leak or, or something else. And then it also dumps out things like the objects, and it marks uh, custom objects or objects that are not like system or Microsoft or something like that, uh, marks them in, in a separate color so you can easily identify them. And then it also goes in 
and dumps out all the cache items if it's an ASP.NET process. So without WinDBG, you can still get a lot of juicy information from debug diag, and you don't have to remember all the, all the ways to call things. And if we do the same thing that we've been doing before and go ahead and open this in, um, uh, in Visual Studio instead. So we'll go ahead and open that up. In this case, we're going to do debug managed memory because we're looking at what's causing the memory issue. What this is going to do is it's going to go parse through all the objects that are on the heap, and then it looks through all the routes, so all the static, all the cache, all the session, everything like that, and then it's going to create chains for all the objects that are on the heap. And then it tells us um, how many of each we have. If we dump, if we have multiple dumps, we can also do differentiate, like we can differentiate between them and see how many we've grown by and so forth. And in this case, if we look at the news controller, uh, let's go ahead and do like that. Then at the bottom here, what we'll see is like the memory, like the chains or the root chains for all of them. So it says, out of these 31,027 news controllers, 31,027 of them are rooted in a call, a cache item removed callback. So this is obviously a, a pretty easy way again to, to look at a dump without even knowing WinDBG. So capture multiple dumps uh, if you want to see the diff and everything. Um, figuring out what objects are leaking to so see if you see anything out of the ordinary or something that you're not expecting to have so many of. And then run GC root or look in Visual Studio to see why they're still around. This heap thing, if you're stopped at a breakpoint or something, you can also use this heap thing. This is um, um, part of the diagnostic tools of Visual Studio. So you can go in and create a snapshot, run the process a little bit more, create another snapshot, and see the differences without doing memory dumps. So those are essentially some really short examples of how you, how you troubleshoot these kind of issues. Sometimes you have um, a lot of memory dumps, like if you, if you used Windows error reporting and you captured every time someone had a crash or every time, um, I don't know, every time the process crashed at some place or every time they had an exception or something, and you want to automate the process a little bit and um, run commands on lots of dumps at the same time. In that case, you can go through and you can open up um, a project, like a .NET project, and import uh, the NuGet package for CLRMD. So CLRMD is our Microsoft Diagnostics Runtime. Um, it's a package that will let you do things like this, like open up a memory dump or even attach to a process if you want to, um, and then get things like the runtime or whether or not it's running the GC heap or anything really that you can get from a memory dump, like with SOS, you could also get from CLRMD. And you can do things like loop through all the threads in the process, figuring out if they have an exception, and if they do have an exception, print out the thread ID and um, the exception and maybe the stacks, log it out and store them in some bucket, and then if you reach a point where you have like more than 10 of the same issue, then go ahead and, and troubleshoot that. So this is if you want to go that extra mile and do automation. Um, but with that, um, um, I'm just going to leave you with a few resources and uh, leave a few minutes if you have any questions. So debug diag, where you download debug diag, and on my blog, uh, blogs.microsoft.com slash test, you'll find a lot of um, demos and labs and stuff like that if you want to actually go through and try this yourself. Um, the presentation is on SlideShare and the demo projects are on GitHub, so you can just grab them from there. But I'll leave it up for questions if you have any. Or I'll see you uh, later in the panel, I guess. So thank you. <laughs>